to PT Theater's youth troupe production of Dexter and the Dinosaurs. Now I have to tell you something before we start. Because this play is mainly about the story of one person named Dexter Marsh, we wanted a few kids to be able to play him. So whoever's wearing this hat, that's who's being Dexter right then. Just so you know. No confusion. Enjoy the show. Aren't you coming? 
coming to school? I have chores to do. I'd rather do chores than go to school. Not me. Dexter, how are you going to become smart if you don't go to school? I don't know. <laughs> Come on, guys, we're going to be late. Dexter only went to school in the winter when there wasn't other work he could do. When he was eight, he stood on a block to yoke oxen because he wasn't tall enough. Wow! In 1832, at the age of 26, he moved to Greenfield, where he paid a dollar and fifty cents a week for boarding, while doing all kinds of things like shoveling and, and gardening. gardening and picking and apples and. A lot of things were made with stone, and for stone, you needed tools or gunpowder. Because he himself had dug up the stone beside the Connecticut River. He tried to share his strange discovery with people from the town. Excuse me, but would you like to see something rather unusual? Huh. These are bird tracks. Of course they are, Mr. Mott. I always thought that man a bit odd. <laughs> Became so heavy, Mr. Marsh. You don't understand. Look, see how the tracks the right and left parallel each other? Even the wrinkles in the beast's skin. I hope the beast doesn't decide to eat us. Eat us? Eat us. How droll. <laughs> <laughs> but there was one man who didn't laugh at him. Dr. James <laughs> Dean of Greenfield. No relation. I don't, I don't know quite how they came to be here. But they are the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. Remarkable indeed. We need to tell Dr. Hitchcock about this. Dr. Dean took a plaster cast of the strange tracks in the stone and sent the cast to Edward Hitchcock in Amherst. Trouble with your horse? No, he's fine. 
Hitchcock, is a professor of geology at Amherst College and Massachusetts' first state geologist. He was married to Ora White Hitchcock, who illustrated his geology books with beautiful illustrations while also pursuing her own interests as an artist, naturalist, and scientist. Ding dong! Thank you. A rather large package has arrived for you, dear. Oh, oh, rather large indeed. Ah, from Dr. Dean. Thought you'd be interested in these tracks found in Flagstone by the Connecticut in Charters Falls. Appear to be some kind of large turkey. But I never... What's the matter, dear? These tracks must be very, very, very... Very what, dear? Oh! Where are you going? We must go to Greenville to see the real thing. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> Meanwhile, Dexter Marsh was discovering more tracks in Flagstone around Greenfield that had been hiding in plain sight for years. Look, you can even see them in the eaves of that house. Incredible, no one's ever noticed them. Dr. Hitchcock and Aura Hitchcock arrived. Welcome, Professor, Mrs. Hitchcock. Please meet Dexter Marsh, who happened upon these tracks while laying stone. It's an honor, sir, ma'am. Benson has been finding them in more stone around the town. As I thought, these tracks are some kind of large bird. How old do you think they are? This flagstone is perhaps, 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 perhaps what? From the Jurassic period. <laughs> Some species. A giant bird. Lives here. Presumably with. All kinds of. Other creatures. Watching all their predators better close. 
Dr. Hitchcock purchased some of Dexter Marsh's slabs of stone and took them back to Amherst, where he studied them very carefully and then published scientific papers, which caused quite a bit of excitement in places like London. Large, bird-like prints, stone, hit Massachusetts, Hitchcock. Mm. One of Hitchcock's readers over in England was Richard Owen, who seven years later would invent the word dinosaur. So, see, what I'll do is I'll take a, a Greek word, dinos, which means terrible, and another Greek word, saurus, which means lizard. Mash them all together and you get dinosaur, or terribly fearful lizard, which seems just about right from the fossils I can find. Right up! Right up! Of course, Dexter Marsh read Dr. Hitchcock's papers and began reading other books about geology to understand more about the tracks he had discovered. Books like Hitchcock's Geology of Massachusetts, books about chemistry, ornithology, the Geological Survey of seven, uh, New York in 17 volumes, and even Conchology. Now, is what anyone is that? Well, good question. Does anyone out there have a guess of what conchology might be? Ooh, shell, right. Has anyone ever heard of conch shell? Conchology is the study of shells. So. And Dexter Marsh built a boat for himself. Maybe with the help of some friends. And he began traveling up and down the Connecticut River to look for more fossils. Sometimes he'd spend several days or even a week going from spot to spot. When the sun went down, he'd just pull his boat on shore, turn it over, and sleep underneath them. Then, when the rosy pre-dawn glow hit the water and the exposed stones along the riverbank, he'd crawl out from beneath the boat Maybe there were even animals and fish who wondered what this strange human seemed so happy about, standing by the Connecticut in the dark. While other scientists might have been more comfortable waking up in their warm beds, Mr. Marsh felt he was the lucky.
the next 10 years finding fossilized prints while continuing to work as a handyman and custodian. In 1838, his wife Rebecca died, leaving him two young children to take care of. The next year, he married Eunice Everett from Vermont. <laughs> he sold some of his finds to Dean and Hitchcock, donated others to museums, and kept some for his own growing collection. Even though he was the main supplier of fossils, Hitchcock and Dean did not mention Marsh in their scientific papers until 1845, ten years after that day of discovery in Greenfield. Instead, Hitchcock and Dean were disputing who should get credit for the discoveries. I'm the one who really understands their classification. But I'm the one that made the discovery. If I didn't send them to you. But I'm the one who knew what they were. We still can't say for sure these are just traps. The public wants bones. Bone schmones. Bone schmones you. Bone schmones me. Bone schmones you. <laughs> me. <laughs> you. <laughs> Me! <laughs> you! <laughs> Me! <laughs> Us! Uh, hello! <laughs> what? Marsh was not a candidate for being credited with a major scientific discovery. He was a common man, or as the minister at his church and the father of modern beekeeping, Lorenzo Langstroth, called him a very uncommon man, a great force in originality, one of the strongest thinkers and closest reasoners with whom I have ever became conversant. <laughs> Langstroth invented the modern... <laughs> the modern-day beehive, and came to know Marsh when he hired him as a gardener. Eventually, Dean and Hitchcock started mentioning Marsh in their papers, and eventually people began to come visit the Pioneer Valley from Europe <coughs> and other places to see what all the fuss was about. And they met Mr. Marsh, who showed them what he had found, and sometimes even sent them casts or prints. And sometimes... Dexter sent people casts or prints who hadn't even asked for them, like the Emperor of Russia. <laughs> I don't know. It came from America. It was like old rocks. Oh, do I have old rocks here? Then I send it back. <laughs> Hitchcock even named a dinosaur after him, Herpestosum marshi, which means Marsh's creeping animal because by now, Marsh had also found prints of creatures with four legs. Just don't call me late for dinner! <laughs> <laughs> Marsh's collection was growing so large, he decided to build a museum or cabinet. Onto his house, he put everything in. And in 1846, people began coming to visit from all over the world. Some of them were famous, and some not. That same year, he was elected a member of the American Association of Geologists and Naturalists. In 1848, Marsh sent his own description of his findings to the American Journal of Science, where it was published verbatim. That means just as he wrote it. <laughs> I succeeded in obtaining two or three hundred footprints of various birds and quadrupeds. Many of them entirely new. I only forward you a sketch of the footprints of one of the quadrupeds. You'll see that it is a walking, not a leaping animal. The forefeet are very small in proportion to the hind toes. The toes are very slim and tapering, terminating in a point with a sharp claw, which is very distinct. 
The toes are spread wide and curve outward very much, which is not the case with any of those I have heretofore obtained. In 1852, I was very grateful to be elected to membership in the Lyceum of Natural History of New York and made a corresponding member of the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. I am also a member of the Boston Society of Natural History, later known as the Museum of Science. And although we can't know for sure, there might have been groups of school children who came to visit my cabinet with their teachers to discover what I have discovered. All right, children, you may now put away your books. Seeing how the weather is fine today, I've decided we are going on a little trip downtown. Yay! 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 Where are we going? You'll see. Can you please tell us where we're going? Have any of you visited <coughs> Mr. Marsh's Cabinet of Wonders? I have. And what did you think? It was interesting. Just interesting? Well, he wasn't there, so I didn't know what things were. Well, today, I happen to know that he is there, and he will explain everything to us. children? Good morning, sir. Would you like to see my little museum? Yes, sir. Well, why don't we start with this first? Here you'll see a slab of sandstone, and scattered across it, we see what? Tracks. Yeah. Tracks of what? A giant bear? Look more closely. An ostrich. Where did you learn about the ostrich? My parents gave me a book about Australia. And do you know how large an ostrich becomes? About nine feet. Right. <laughs> and do you know how heavy an ostrich who's nine feet tall might be? I don't know, sir. Well, they can grow to be about 300 pounds. <clears throat> Looking at this track, we see it is about 16 inches long. That means that it belonged to a bird that weighed close to 1,000 pounds. Yeah. Now, so a gigantic ostrich? Mm, good guess. It is actually called an Ornithicnete giganteus. Oh, what? Ornithicnete giganteus, a kind of giant bird that lived here long ago. What did it look like? You'll have to use your imagination. And you all will have to go out and discover all the fossils that I can no longer find myself. Because do you know what my dearest wish is? What? What, what? what sir? It is that the town of Greenfield purchase my entire collection for a modest sum and preserve this collection for the town of Greenfield and all the young and old people from this region to continue inspiring and sparking the imaginations of young people and old people like me. The town of Greenfield's own fossil museum. <laughs> Thank you. 
so much. Um, they'd like to know in case you'd like their autograph. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we're very pleased to be presenting this uh, great Greenfield Dino Fest with the Pontic Valley Memorial Association and uh, our host, Second Congregational Church. And we'd also like to thank the Greenfield Cultural Council for their support, Mass Humanities for their support, and the Mass Cultural Council for their support. In just a few minutes, um, we're going to have a panel discussion up here with some very interesting folks including, well, I'll introduce them when they're here uh, for the discussion, and about local history and dinosaur history. I'd like to point out that we have a, a PT Theater raffle to support our work in underserved communities. Uh, we're raffling off a pair of Red Sox tickets. Come uh, back, you can talk to Laura. And our next show, we have a, a show called Sammy and the Grand Buffet, which is also a family audience's show at the Shea Theater on November 18th which includes a workshop for kids and for adults who would like to uh, hone their clowning skills. Very useful at work, at home, <laughs> all kinds of places. And we'd also like to thank our sponsors, which include PBMA, James Collins, Stephanie and Lori Gordon, Franklin Community Cooperative, Noble Home, Swiss Harmony, Bay State Tax Service, Better World Auto Club, Greenfield Savings Bank, Catalyst Kombucha, Real Pickles, and Tire Warehouse. And uh, in case you don't know, after the panel, then you'll have a lunch break. Then at 2 o'clock, uh, the Greenfield Historical Society will be open with casts of Dexter Marsh's finds, available from 2 to 5. At 6 o'clock, we've got a uh, Real Pickle Brine reception at 170 Main Street, in case you haven't done that before. Uh, Real Pickle Brown Reception 6, and a Dino Movies Through the Ages collage or montage film with a live cellist at 7. And uh, the space is limited, so if you want to be absolutely sure to have a seat for that, you might want to sign up. There's a sign-up sheet back there. And at 8, we're going to show a film called Microwave Science and Lies, which is sort of in our Extinction Stinks theme. Um, it's about uh, corruption of the World Health Organization related to wireless uh, microwave radiation standards. So, thank you so much for coming, and I hope you stick around for the panel, and this is also your chance to become a sponsor of this production. Um, Laura and Julie are going to, please, Eliza and Julie, going to go around. In case you'd like to make a donation to PT Theater, it goes to help our work like this and our work in underserved communities, bringing our shows to places that can't fully pay for them themselves. Thanks so much for coming out, and please stick around for the panel. Marsh was, I think you did that. You just accomplished that. It was fantastic. Thank you so much.